Good morning and welcome. That was I've like done that. it 121 <laughs> times. And 121 times you've laughed, actually. No, I've, I've probably only done it 50 or 60 because Mark Jeffries did it for the first, like, 40. Well, which would not even make sense for the math anyways that way. But every time you laugh at I've tried, I've tried every other way to, to, to intro the show, Uncle it's, Frank. It's nervous energy, dude. I can't, I can't help it. Show 121. Like I said last week, we were going from the top a frog fishing extravaganza to the bottom, a brush pile primer. Is it a primer or a primer? What did they used to call it back in school? A primer, a primer, primer, we, a brush we, pile primer. Yes. So we, we uh, alluded to that effect at the last episode. Um, yeah. We're just going to broaden our playing field here. We got, we've got bass shallow in the grass and now we're going to go, brush pile fishing i like it did you uh are you sporting some new threads dude you know i got i have to i have to advance my wardrobe expand expand advance and advance and advance but that looks like a brand new shirt that you broke out just for day four uncle frank i mean i've not seen that over the past it's never been it's never been on day four i don't believe and you will be auctioning off day four worn clothing on your new website <laughs> by Frank's undergarments.com. I think not. I no? think not. Oh, okay. Sorry. No. I didn't know. You weren't ready <laughs> no. to go public with that one. We're not going there. No, I just wanted new stuff to fish in, uh, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. because, you know, I don't understand, but every time, every time I'm in that bass boat, I, for whatever the reason, because I'm always monkeying around with stuff, you know, you mm-hmm. get out of the boat, you go to the gas station, you put the oil in, you do the thing. I, I've i got oil stains and battery acid holes on everything I own, and I'm not 100% sure why. So I said, you know what, we're going to, we're, we're doing a new, we're, we're going a new here, and I'm going to ruin all these clothes in about two months also now did this involve (laughs) uh did this involve the better half or was this a solo excursion or was this an online shopping i'm curious as to how new garments end up in your wardrobe i don't buy clothes online i go to the store i have to look at them i have to try them on and that's what i do and no my wife does not she doesn't make you go in and then come out and be like turn around i like that one yeah we can buy that and then you have to then she knocks on the door and says what does that one look like no, because I, I, I don't uh, shop for you, my clothes with her, no. You would lose your mind if you had to do that, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, that doesn't, that's not in my world. <laughs> that, that is absolutely not in my world. Fashion tips. <laughs> I, have, I have a critter crawling in my window here. Get, get out a cat there. or an actual critter? No, an actual, uh, an like ant. a bug. Oh, like okay. an ant. So now it is a smashed ant. Oh, that's okay. Not a drunk ant but I squashed ant. There you go. All right. Uh, good show today. We are in the heat of the summer, the middle of summer. The spawn is done everywhere. Thank the post God. spawn is done. <laughs> Thank We're God. middle of July. The post spawn's done everywhere. Oh, yeah, it's done. We are oh. mid-summer time bass fishing now. We are finally getting back to where I want to be. Which is out in the middle of the lake, chucking at some sunken wood. Right, exactly. So that's what we're talking about today. We're going to go into brush pile. So here's what we're going to do. I believe um, I have some illustrations to show you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about brush piles and their makeup. We're going to pull up some Navionics maps. Um, I'm going to show you on a map how I look for high percentage brush piles, what I look for. I have some shallow brush breakdown, dock brush breakdown, uh, deep brush pile breakdowns on what I like to fish them, how to fish them. Um, And we'll just, hell, let's just roll. I like it. We haven't done this. We've talked about brush piles in passing as part of summertime patterns, but we've never done a deep dive into the brush. We never have. And here, I'll be honest with you. I got, I received a DM from, um, a loyal fan who said, why don't you ever talk about brush piles? 
See, and that so, works. I love, we love the emails, the comments, the DMs, yeah. the messages. Keep them coming. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's not because I never wanted to talk about them. It's just escaped me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We talk about so much other things. So um, should we roll? Let's yeah, let's roll. roll. Let's get into it. Five minutes in and we're already talking about what we're supposed to be talking about. That might be a record for the show, Frank. I know. <laughs> Usually, usually it's like 19 minutes in and we're like, oh, we better start talking about this. Right. It's like, oh, crap, we got a, we got a topic to cover. <laughs> That's the beauty we're part. Bloviating. About this. We have we are bloviating. Um, OK, so really, in my opinion, there's two types of uh, there's really two types of brush piles um, here. Let me I'm going to make an adjustment on my computer. OK. There we go. Um, I had to take off all the extraneous stuff and make the screen bigger. So I, cause I get distracted easy. It's like, uh, you know, it's part of my problem. I get, I'm distracted really easily. So anyway, back to the brush pile. So there's really two types of brush piles. Um, you know, natural man-made brush piles, obviously, um, brush that gets blown into the lake and sinks on its own like floating wood trees during flooding um and then and so the makeup of these brush piles you're either going to have some that are just some heavy thicker branches not it's sparse not a lot of anything to it just a couple of trunks or a couple of mm -hmm. you know big branches and then you're going to have the ones that they're like bass condos. They're just piles of gnarly, nasty, thick branches. They're just bushes. It's like underwater bushes. That's really what you're going to find. Um, some of the ones that are thinner, uh, not as many branches, that could just be from age because the thinner branches are the first to decay and go away. And so along with age, the brush piles break down. So what you, you may find a really big, thick brush pile, and then three years, four years down the road, it becomes thin and sparse. And so really that's kind of the two that you're going to find. They're either going to be plush and new and rich or they're robust. Be, yeah. Or they're going to be broken down. Um, so but the, basically when you're looking for brush piles, when you're trying to find brush piles, um, the first places I start to look, depending on how far along we are in the summer pattern, inside turns on points. So as a point of land comes out, I can probably scribble something for this. We don't have to pull up Let's a topographical it. map for this. So, so I, so there, I have. Find, you're going to find, you're looking for natural areas where brush is going to Co congregate or, or or get pushed up against or pushed into where natural brush piles would most likely occur well that's one thing but man-made brush piles these are just man-made this is be man-made brush piles okay so this okay. is stuff that did not exist someone took it upon themselves to to gather together Correct. some wood put a cinder block on it truck it out to the lake and dump it right exactly so so here's what I found. So uh, on the point of land, this will be the shallow stuff, and it gradually gets deeper mm -hmm. and gradually goes farther out into the lake. The inside turns on these points, the inside swing, outside swing. This is the high percentage spot. This is where I want to find the brush on these two locations on this point because that that's where – that the bass will use that most of the time. And so that's where I want to find the brush. So I'll, I'll start looking there and then I'll look at, as I'm on a lake, I'll look at slow tapering points. I'll look at points with sharp edges on them, almost not bluffy, but kind mm -hmm. of bluffy steeper. Um, that's where I'm looking in the beginning, you know, right after the spawn, that's what I'm looking for, where the fish are starting to move out on those points. Uh, the next place that I like to look is on the drop-off ends of flats that come out. Um, we could pull a map up. I think we got – pull the Navionics up. I know we have 
Uh, we talked about that flats that come out in the lake and then drop off. Um, go to, yeah, you go to where them buoys are. Yeah, that's it. So that, there you have, you have a big flat that comes out into the lake and then you see the, the, they got four fish attractors or something on them. Um, that's a ledge. Whoa. Whoa. We covered Whoa. the whole United States in yeah. an instant. Um, that's the ledge that I really would focus on. And you, cause you could, you'll have that stuff. That's good too. Right where you were. That's fine too. I like this one better. Okay. So you'll see how the flat comes out and it's got a real steep drop off on it. Probably where those fish markers are. That's something that I would look at um, in summertime when the fish are getting off the shore, they're moved up. They've already moved out there. You have enough shallow water on there. The flat is big enough to hold numbers of fish. That's another thing that's critical. Um, and then I'll side scan that whole ledge and look for brush piles. And the key places that I want them to be is on any of the inside turns, any of the irregularities on the edge of that flat. Um, that's where those will be the high percentage brush piles. Now, this this is um, this is actually Lake Eufaula. In and Alabama. I, in Alabama. And I made my first classic on this lake um, doing exactly that. That's exactly how I made the classic. Um, I was looking for these isolated brush piles, uh, very strategically placed. And the thing that I liked the most about them was that I could find pretty good size brush piles that were isolated away from most and a majority of the fishing pressure. And so that's what I focused on. I had several up in this area and several way up the river that I was fishing. So you're going to want to do that. Some of the other lakes that turn into um, so here, when you're looking at a river channel, now that you pulled that up, you just spurred my memory. So when you're looking at a river channel like this, the places that I want to look are where high spots intersect the main river channel, where the channel bends, and, I, and on a river channel bend, I want the inside bends. So where those two fish attractors are up there, right there, I want that bend, and then down at the bottom of that and I want that bend. Um, any of the high spots, like the two you were just on, mm -hmm. you're going to, you're going to have to look at those high spots on there as well. Um, where that river channel scrapes up against the bank. Uh, that's another perfect, perfect place to look because it's still relatively near shore, but it's still summertime type of fishing. So that's how I would break down my river channel ledges and look for the river channel ledges. Another sneaky spot to look at, and I don't know if we're going to find them on this lake, are bluffs and bluff ends. You may have to go up the river for that one. Oh, there's some bluffs right there. <laughs> so, so you want to look at bluffs and bluff ends. Um, these brush piles on are sneaky, uh, where you have the super steep break lines that come out and then there's piles of brush down there. Um, I'm going to get into fishing all this stuff in a minute, but that's kind of my quick, that's my quick breakdown on how we're going to find these things. Uh, once you find them, uh, we'll get into fishing. The other set of brush piles that everybody's familiar with are boat docks. Um, boat docks, have brush on them on every lake you go to. People plant brush in front of their boat docks for crappie, uh, panfish, for bass, the, tons of tons of brush on boat docks. So I guess what we'll do is I've got some illustrations here. So we'll do the boat dock first. Uh, since in my opinion, that's probably the easiest uh, brush to fish ever is the boat docks. So here's, what, here's how we're going to do this. I kind of tried. Wow, to, you drew that? Yeah, man, you should try to, man. You could do a, make a living doing that stuff, Frank. I used to, <laughs> <laughs> I got to back up here. So, so when you draw that dock, are you using like a ruler or can you just draw lines that straight? No, for the dock, I used a straight edge, but I could, I could draw a line straight enough to get by, but, but, but I drew it. I is, used a straight edge. Is that something that you might, we might be giving away to a listener or viewer in the future? 
there might be things involved with these photos. I don't know. That one might have to end up in the BTL. That might be in the Hall of Fame. (laughs) That might be in the BTL studio. That's some fine work there, Uncle Frank. Well, I appreciate it. But anyhow. Except they've got that. Sorry. One more thing. You did put you did put the uh, the brace of death in there. Well, which is that crisscross brace just out of sight. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Brace of death. (laughs) They are that, that accounts for more lost bass than anything in a boat dock. Well, that and cables. Yep. Okay. Sorry. But I didn't put the cables in because this is a (laughs) wooden posted dock. So I don't know. Can you see this? Because I have yeah, no, hundred percent. It right, looks can, phenomenal. All right, because I have no vision of my computer screen. Yeah, it looks awesome. So, so this right here, this is the obvious brush pile. It'll be buried underneath the dock. Um, sometimes they run them all the way up underneath the dock. Sometimes they just put them right at the very base end of the dock. This is the obvious brush pile. We're going to do, we could fish this a million different ways to Sunday. Texas rigged anything, shaky head, Nico, uh, wacky rig. This, this, this could be fished in all the typical jig, jig, anything that you want to fish, you could fish with that. Um, The brush piles at the ends of the docks that are not on the dock, they're way off the dock. This distance here could be three feet to 25 yards off the face of the dock. These are what I, these are what I look for. I want them way off the dock, a cast away from the dock. These are the brush piles I'm looking for. They're usually on a break. They'll plant these out there and that's where the break drops down. Um, This is, this is where, a lot of big fish will come for you. The other sneaky part of the boat dock fishing game is the brush piles they plant in between boat, in between docks. Big on Grand Lake. This is another thing that I look for. Like I'll side image down a dock row and look for all the brush that's in between them. Not necessarily the ones underneath because these get the most fishing pressure. Now that's not to say ignore this crud when the, when brush piles are working, you can't ignore it, but these don't get as much fishing pressure. And these, the farther away they are from the front of the dock, the less fishing pressure they got and the better they are. Go ahead. All right. So here, let's, let's do a, uh, let me go back to the full screen there. So just to, to verify that, and then we can go back to the picture because I've got docks pulled up here where my mouse is. You're going to look in there in between docks and then you're going to look out in front of the docks correct where most people are just going to actually fish the docks but that picture that you had was out here and in the middle here of the dock that's that's perfect that's exactly so so anyhow so so with the brush piles that are out and away in between and out and away i'm going to fish in any traditional way that i can um, meaning I, I could throw jerk baits over them. I can throw crank baits on them, Texas rigs, the, the, the usual suspects, shaky head, um, on a lot of the spotted bass fisheries, I'll throw the jig and the shaky head most of the time on them, uh, because it just, it's just the nature of the beast that I'm after. Uh, they prefer that. Um, then so, so, but brush piles dock pretty easy, pretty standard. We don't, I don't, am I missing some important details? No, are all those, all those are man-made though. There's someone that's putting them out in front of the dock and putting them in between and putting them under. Correct. I'll tell you a place you find non man-made brush piles, bluff cave-ins, um, very synonymous with, uh, some of the spotted bass fisheries, um, Smith Lake has a bunch of them where you'll have a bluff table rock has them. You'll have a bluff and there'll be a cave in on the, on the wall of the bluff. You'll see like where a fish or a water comes in Okay, that debris falls down there. The brush, the wood natural goes plumber. in the water, goes down, it sinks. Those are natural brush piles, river systems, anywhere that the river current will pile debris up on high spots on the up current facing side of this, you'll have brush stacked in there. Okay. Those are not man-made. Those are made by weather elements and current. Um, those are also good places to look for. Uh, 
So you have to be cognizant of that. All brush piles are not man-made. Some are natural. They they form natural. The dock brush piles. Uh, are you going to go into how to find those? Because that's a side imaging game, isn't it? Hundred percent side scan. Um, I'll I'll pick a creek arm that has good good depth off of the face of some. If it has a river channel on one side, it's going to be flatter on the other side. So you'll have in the creek that you pick, you'll have the best of both. You'll have like on this particular one, you see the river channels on one side of the creek and then it's flatter on the opposite side. So what that gives you the ability to do is side image in, side image out on both sides. And so you'll and then you'll know if the bass pre are preferring flatter terrain or if they want the steeper breaks because if they're if they want the steeper stuff then you could you don't have to waste time on the flats the flatter stuff and so that's how you that's what's going to be you're going to narrow your pattern down as you go um looking for these brush piles because not as as not all boat docks are created equal not all brush piles are created equal it all depends where they're at which ones the bass are using for what time of year, et cetera. It's a pattern within a pattern. If I told you that I was catching fish out of brush piles, most people would assume I'm probably catching them out of brush and boat docks or shallower brush piles, um, which because there and there's dude, there, there's tons of ways to fish brush piles. Um, but here's some general rules. Let's say. I'm fishing deep brush piles. We'll go 20 feet to 40 foot brush piles. Um, here, I'm going to, I'll use a heavy jig, a drop shot, but overlooked, one of the most overlooked ways to fish brush piles is with a jigging spoon. So if I have a 20 foot or 40 foot, you know, that range, whatever it is, 20 to 40, it doesn't matter as long mm -hmm. as it's deep enough and you can get vertical. The whole key to jigging, spooning brush is you have to be over the top of the brush pile. And then I'll drop the spoon down. I watch it on my 2D sonar. I'll watch the spoon go down and I stop it just above the branch, the top of the brush pile. I stop it just above the top of the brush pile. And then I make, I make quick snaps. I'll do a, a small snap, let it fall, and then I'll do a quick double snap. So I pump it once, whoop, let it fall on a controlled slack line, and then I'll pull it, I'll go two, 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 and then let it fall on a controlled slack line. And I'll work my way all around this brush pile like that. It's absolutely deadly on spotted bass. It's one of the best ways that I can fish deep brush piles for spots. I have literally... I can't even tell you how many I've caught doing that out of them. And the cool thing about jigging spoons is when they snag in the branches, all you have to do, don't pull it to get it out. When it snags in the branch, just shake it. And it's its, its own plug knocker. The spoon is its own plug knocker. And that see right the, there? Yeah, exactly. So here's the thing about, the thing I like about the War Eagle is it's already got the crane swivel attached to it. So if you're using like a CC spoon, which is another great spoon, um, if you're using a CC spoon or a Hopkins spoon, you're going to have to add a split ring and the crane swivel. And so here's what the crane swivel and the split ring do, because we've talked about this before. It gives the spoon more freedom of movement, so it flutters better, and it doesn't give you line twist. That's pretty much that's pretty much it with the with the, the crane swivel and the spoon so and next there's the cc spoon there's a cc spoon and and which is another good one now that spoon there if you took a cc spoon and a hopkins spoon even though they're both three quarters i i throw three quarters of an ounce by the way almost exclusively but if so if they're both three quarters of an ounce the cc spoon is going to have a fall a small a slower fall rate because it flutters like this when it falls, where the Hopkins goes this way. It's got a side-to-side -side motion, and the CC spoon flutters. So based on the aggressive nature of the bass, 
is going to determine which spoon style you're going to throw. Now, notice I didn't say um, casting spoons. We're not fishing these horizontally. We're we're right on top of them, straight up and down, 2D sonar. Show, show the jigging motion that you're going to do. I mean, are you doing quick or are you stroking it up and then letting it fall on a slack line? So I'll 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 snap it up. Okay. And then I f follow it down with the rod. I don't follow it down so the line is straight. There's going to be a bow in your line. It's got to be slack or you kill the action. And you're looking for that line to abruptly stop, to tick, to start moving on. Right. 90% of the time if they hit it on they hit it on the fall. 90% of the time. Okay. It, it'll feel like a worm bite. You'll feel like a thunk. Mm -hmm. And then and the other time if you it, you won't feel the bite, but you, you're watching your 2d sonar. You'll see the fish streak up to it. Okay. This you'll is see. super, not, I don't want to use the term super easy, but this is something that oh, if you find a deep brush easy. pile that has fish on it, particularly spotted bass, this is something that even it, if you're not an easy. electronics expert, you just gave us the blueprint of how to find it and catch them. It's not, yeah. this is not rocket science when it comes no. to the spoon thing. No, that's why it's one of my favorites. You know, we, we fished, we fished on Smith Lake, um, and I was fishing brush piles. Mm -hmm. And the, so the first couple of brush piles, I find the brush piles. I, I jump up on the front of my boat. I drop the trolling motor down. I get over it with the trolling motor, 2d sonar it, drop down there, pump it a couple times, see one streak out, hook it. It's a good spot. I let it go. And I motor on to the next brush pile, you know, trolling motor and looking for the fish. So I was, it was so predictable. I never got out of my driver's seat of my boat at, after that. I stayed in the driver's seat, got on top of the brush pile, dropped my spoon over the side of my seat, pumped it a couple of times, hooked one, reeled it in and left and went and looked for another brush pile. And I practiced almost half the day never getting out of my driver's seat that's how effective this could be but that's how easy it is to fish i'll say this uh, for a long time when i fished from the front of the boat i had I, I wouldn't say a phobia but it just didn't see i didn't get it's a jigging spoon it just it's it's what 80 year old guys use to catch white bass <laughs> that was it in my head. I'm, I know i'm not yeah, talking no. crap about it no you're not but it wasn't until i got out on on our buckle and it was during the winter where I realized the drawing power of a slab of metal. It's unbelievable. And, it, and, and I have a, I have 20 to 40 of the War Eagles in the boat at all times. And when it's on, like you said, it it's not like you fish all day for one or two bites. Like they come and they eat the dang thing. Oh, yeah. And you see it unfold. Mm -hmm. You see the whole thing. In fact, half the time, you know, that if there's a fish in the brush pile, because the minute that spoon stops over the branches and you mm -hmm. pump it once, they streak right up to it. Um, you can see them on the screen. It's pretty cool. Um, that's my deep brush pile gig. Okay. Um, I, I, I love throwing the heavy jig, but the problem that I have jig fishing gnarly brush piles is they hang up a lot. Yep. Even even though the weed guards today, their design in them is really good, the angle's appropriate, um, it falls through all the branches and gets hung up a lot when you're trying to pull them back out and worm them up over another set of branches. So I kind of, I'll do the weedless drop shot, a Texas rig, jigging spoon, but if I'm if I'm really on the deep brush, I'm leaning more on the spoon for that um, brush. That's 10 to 20 feet deep. That's a different animal. Um, crankbaits could reach it. Some of our deep diving jerk baits today could get it close enough to them to pull bass off of them. But here's where I'm really into the 10 inch worm. Um, that 10 foot to 20 foot brush pile for me, you can't hardly beat a 10 inch worm in there. Um, you're appealing to a better quality bass. It's slithering and snaking its way through the branches. It is literally a hundred percent weedless. Um, 
it's just so effective. Um, again, I will throw jigs in there if the bass are showing me they would rather have the jig bite, but I'm more leaning towards a 10 inch worm. Even I'll even go with a like a six and a half, seven inch finesse worm in that situation. But if I'm throwing the finesse worm, I'm using the lightest possible weight I can and still maintain contact with the brush um, because it's a little different when you're fishing the finesse worm. It's kind of a finessey approach where the, the 10 inch worm, I'll, I'll use the lightest slip sinker I can get away with, but that's not a necessity. Sometimes you can put it on a three eighth, five sixteenth, mm -hmm. chuck it out there, let it get through the brush and do your thing. We're talking um, ribbon tail, a 10 inch ribbon tail. Yeah. Ribbon tail. Um, deep, deep jerk baits, crank baits. Um, you know, I, 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 when you're fishing a crank bait through the brush, here's the main thing. I want it to tick the branch, advance, tick a branch, advance, tick a branch, advance, and then you're out of the brush pile and you could change your angle, make a new cast. Um, my absolute all-time favorite crankbait for brush piles is a DD-22 or a, or a Deep Little N. Um, Fat-free shads have to be my next favorite, usually a, a Fat-free 7 or a Fat-free 6, uh, because they have a tendency to come through the brush the best. Um, the DD-22 will come through dang near anything you could throw it in. Mm -hmm. You just have to be aware um when you're cranking that bait down into the brush you have to be aware you'll start to feel it get mushy in the branch and at that point what i'll do is i'll stop reeling a little bit and i'll start sw sweeping with my rod i'll let the rod pull the bait i can feel it going in ricocheting up over going back in and so i'll use more of a rod pull when i'm doing that and it as soon as I come free again, I'll start to retrieve. Nothing is. You're feathering it. I'm feathering it through the brush. I am not cranking <laughs> it down in there and, you know, like I'd fish a rock pile. Yeah, yeah. This is very meticulous fishing, but the bass that you catch on Kentucky Lake one time, it was like manna from heaven doing this. So, but you you have to be patient when you're crank baiting brush piles. You have to be patient. Now, let me ask you this: You're in a derby. You're not fun fishing, or you are fun fishing, but you want to maximize your brush. You've got your DD twenty two or your NR their crank bait down there, or even your worm, and you're two casts in. You know there's fish in there, and you hang the sucker up. Oh, dude, that's I hate that. All right, that this is my question. You start winching on the thing, and rah, rah, rah. do you go in and get it? Do you break it off? How hard do you pull? Like, what is the best? This is a serious question that I struggle with, Frank. What is the best way when you get hung? Because you will get hung. You will. To to get a bait back in there without completely screwing up the spot. And what are some things that guys do? that mess up the brush pile before they can even experience the joys of pile fishing? Well, the first mistake is to start pulling at it. Okay. Here's why. When the, when the crank snags up in there, even your, even your, even your worm or jig, what I do is I grab the line. I'll, I'll get the line like a bow and arrow and I'll, I'll pull the line and I let it go twing. So it snaps back and slacks itself. So it's slack. You are pulling it mm -hmm. like a bow and arrow, boom. And you let it go. A lot of times it'll dislodge it. Sometimes it won't. So if it doesn't dislodge it, there's a simple, simple, simple solution. Um, and you can make these yourself. So basically you get a, you get a mold, a jig mold. And you put a paper clip in it. You put the paper clip in it. And then this is an ounce to two ounces of lead and your paper clip. 
And then you take your line and you put your line inside the paper clip. And then you tighten the line up and you send that thing down in there and it'll go down there and it'll hit the bill of the crankbait. Most of the time it dislodges it. If it doesn't, you just shake it and you'll feel the weight smacking into your crankbait and then it'll dislodge it and you can take it up. That's probably the least it's probably the Obtrusive. least right. Cause, but if you start pulling on the branches, yeah. here's the problem. Some brush piles aren't anchored well anymore. <laughs> and so you start to move the entire brush pile. And once you start to move the brush pile, the fish get goofy. Or you go right over it to get up to where to try to un unsnag it. Cause I'm talking about that deal. You roll up, there's a brush pile, you know, there's fish in it. You make your cast and you go crap. That's well, where, that's what yeah. that's what you're talking about. That's the least obtrusive way is to send the pocket whopper down there. Correct. And pop that it for Okay. And so the now the other thing is if I hang a crankbait up in there, I'll set the rod aside and I'll grab my worm rod and I'll throw if it's the legal. worm down there. If it's legal, I'll throw the worm down there. Okay. And then I then I I'll fish it with the soft plastic and then I'll go get the crankbait later or if I screw the brush pile up and I'm in a derby, I'll just go back later and fish the brush pile because they'll settle down within 25, 30 minutes. They'll be right back to normal. They're not going to vacate and go, oh, our house is shaking. We got to go somewhere else. They'll come right back. They, you're, just, you're just taking them and moving them out of the brush pile is what you're doing. Okay. Um, Sorry. I didn't mean to throw you off there, but that, oh, was, no, that was very important that I think is, everyone struggles with. It's it was insanely important. So let me see. Deep brush pile illustration. That was the ten to ten to twenty foot brush pile illustration with the, the, with the big worm. Now, are you pegging that big worm, Uncle Frank? Always. Okay. Always. I don't want the worm separating from the slip sinker because then the slip sinker has a tendency to fall in between thin little branches, and then the worm follows gradually, and then when you go to pick back up you're you're tangling everything up around the branches so i always peg i'm always peg basic colors are you going uh blue fleck and That's, plum blue fleck is my number one there color right for there. deep brush without a doubt I just have, because watercolor transparency even if it's yeah, semi-clear water you have less light penetration down right. there you've got a, a you've got right you'll never have a fish that goes that doesn't look natural on blue fleck no, blue fleck is my number one go-to. I have literally hundred bags of them things. Um, red shad is another one, but here's the funny thing: at a certain dip, at a certain depth, red red turns black. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. You have the, the the red shad will reflect UV light, and so does blue fleck. Um, so you're still getting some reflection characteristics out of it, but it's subtle. Blue fleck is probably my favorite ever for fish and brush piles. And you said weight wise, you want to go with the lightest possible that you can to get always. down and feel the brush. Always. I always do that. Um, I'm not punching it. You know what I mean? I'm not mm -hmm. punching it. It's all finesse fishing, even though you're fishing, a, you know, with 17 or 20 pound fluoro, you're still finesse fishing the brush pile. You'd be surprised how many fish you can pull off of one if they're using it. The other thing, the other brush piles, we're going to, I'm going to call it zero to 10 feet. I have shallow brush. Shallow brush. I have it broken down zero, three, five, ten. But you know what? Let's just go. All right, we'll go zero to three feet. This first. This is real easy. Um, I'm throwing a buzzbait over the top of it. If I see them little stick ups mm -hmm. sitting there, that buzzbait's coming out. It's going over the top of it. Uh, fat boy. It fat boy. I'm running it right through the middle of the brush Square pile. Bell square bill all the way um again worms and jigs spinner bait if it's rainy or the water's dirty or it's windy out and the spinner bait can play i'll throw the spinner bait through that but i'm not going to monkey around too much with the spinner bait i'm going to put on a half ounce and i'm going to freaking beat the branches with it i want i want to feel that spinner bait boom, 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 through them branches um 
worms and jigs, obviously. I mean, obviously. Um, I don't even know why I say that every time I say the brush pile. Um, the buzzbait and the fat boy can be a real special treat in those shallower brush piles um, because you could get bites on neutral feeders. Um, the neutral fish that aren't feeding real well. And you, if you don't have to sit there and monkey around for 15 minutes in a brush pile, don't. Because if the fish are in there, they're in there. And, and you could catch them. You think um, the fish are living living in the brush pile and feeding next to the brush pile? Or are there fish that just go to the brush pile to feed and then when they're neutral are somewhere else? Like, how do you think they're using okay. it? Are there neutral fish in the brush pile or active or both? I think you have both because okay. what, what I've noticed on, on lakes with blueback herring, mm -hmm. we, we discussed it a hundred times. Um, the pelagics follow the bluebacks. They stop and they, they the, the, the herring also use that as cover. A lot of times the, the herring and the shad don't actually go into the branches. They suspend over the branches. Okay. The pelagics come in and they use that as ambush points. The bass that live there, they have a free meal. When the bait fish come by, they have a free meal. Remember, some shad, like gizzard shad, feed on the bottom debris for part of their feeding habit. They also eat the algae and the plankton off the branches. Okay. So you have a whole lot of different things going on in brush piles. The bass like the brush piles a lot because bass love overhead cover. Bass love having cover over top of them. In the form I've caught the I've I caught a bass on Eufaula out of a um a brush pile that it was not even a brush pile. It was one branch. It was just one branch and the fish was almost seven pounds. So they just like something over their head. So you have to be cognizant of that. Um another the other thing that I really like now five to ten foot and we're going to have to change that to five to 20 with the deep diving jerk baits that we have today, but jerk baits over brush piles, you guys that have been on this forward facing sonar game long before me, cause I just recently started doing it, but you guys made jerk baits relevant all year long. Because when you throw a jerk bait over a brush pile, Matt, you can talk about it because you did it the other day. Um, fishing a jerk bait over the brush pile, you see the bass come out of the brush, come up for the jerk bait with forward facing sonar. Kind of like I do with 2D sonar and the jig and spoon, forward facing is doing that's the a, same that's thing. That's a great, great representation of it because you're basically suspending a bait over the top of it and drawing the fish out just like you are with the jigging spoon in the deep water, except you're doing it in a lot shallower water. hundred percent. So that, that, that'll look, that'll look something like this. Yep. You've got your brush pile on your channel break or on your flat, you pump, you pull the jerk bait down and you are literally right yep. over the branches on that. And sometimes you want to crash it into the top and pull it out to see if there's anything in there. Sometimes you need to move it fast over the top and they'll shoot out and they'll eat it. Other times you suspend it over the brush and you'll see them slowly rise. The right. amazing thing is that there will be big fish in the heart of those things that you'll never know are there until they see a jerk bait over the top of it. Right. Cause they, they come out, their predatory nature is uncanny and they're in these brush piles to ambush food. That's great so, stuff, Frank. So they're actually, they're looking, they're looking for something to come over that brush pile. Bait fish and prey animals don't go looking to get eaten. Okay. <laughs> they don't. So they're going to not just go, Hey, there's something cool. I'm going to run in there and then get smoked when they go in there. They're going to be above it or around it in some fashion. Mm -hmm. um, crayfish. Um, your bottom dwelling creatures, that's different. They're, they have to be there. They crawl around down there. They, I've seen crayfish eating the algae off of brush pile branches. Um, I've seen crayfish underneath mats, upside down underneath mats, eating the, 
vegetation and the little snails that go on the grass mats. They have to be in and around that stuff, but bait fish doesn't. And no bait fish is going to go blindly into something knowing it's not yeah. going to survive. That's why bait fish hang out in schools because there's safety in numbers. For one, they look like a bigger animal. Instead of a lot of little ones, they look like a bigger animal. It's always the cripples and the ones that go off to the side that veer away that are the first ones to get gobbled up. And that and and bass know that they they make their living doing that. So that's that's kind of um, brush pile 101. You know I what I mean? It. Even though, like, I, I'll be honest with you, I've never forward faced a jerk bait over a brush pile yet. Don't do it. I haven't done it yet. Don't ever I, start it. Cause <laughs> it's like, but crack. I, but I am. Cause I do a lot of, I do a, a, a tons of jerk bait fishing in the winter time and Frankie with his forward facing sonar, him and I fished off of that a couple last year and a year before in the winter time a lot. And it was, a, it was an absolute blast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see them come up for it and everything. It was a lot of fun. So I, I can't wait to employ this to my, to my brush pile techniques and then later on i can talk about it with you after mm -hmm. i after i get better doing it so on 2d sonar you go over a pile what do you want to see that tells you that it's a, a, a an active pile that has everything that you want as opposed to a, a pile that sucks that nothing is actually using i'm talking about either a 2d or a side imaging where you can look at it on your screen and say, that's a brush pile that I need to put a drop shot into a jig on a jerk bait over okay. a worm in, because that's what you're really, when we get down to this, that's what you're really looking for is identify right. so, a productive brush, regardless of the depth. So that goes into the types of brush piles, um, heavy and thick and a lot of branches. There's going to be something in it. Um, the sparser the brush pile is on 2D sonar, you can see if there's a fish in it. Okay. The thicker it is, you start to it starts to look as one object on 2D sonar. Yep. Um, even 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 with down imaging, you'll see the branches, but the thicker it is, it gets it gets bright and bally in the middle of it. Those brush piles are really good brush piles. Now, a lot of times. The deeper the brush, the deep brush piles, you'll come over the top of them and you'll see bait fish above them or to the side of them, or they're on a good break line. Like if the, if the brush pile itself is sitting on a structural element, I have to stop and look at it in more detail because if it's on a break line, it's on a highway. If it's on a rock pile, it's on a stopping point. And so that's what, that's what you're going to want to look at. Okay. So that's a good, that's a really good image. Yep. What I'm, what I'm seeing here, Frank, is this is what you're talking about. Uh, this is down imaging, not side Correct. imaging, but this is the 2d, but you're seeing the sparseness. This is a perfect example. Cause you're seeing the sparseness up here, which you're seeing on your 2d, which is sparse, but then you're also seeing stuff that's a lot thicker, especially this little thing on the right. right. Am I reading that correctly? You are. And that little thing on the right where your arrow is, that could be the money spot right there. That will probably hold a big fish because it's away from the main gig, but it's close enough. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like there's two fish on down imaging. Uh, Right there and right there. Yeah. Yep. And there's some fish around here on the down imaging, but that's just an example of a, a pile versus a limb. Correct. And you can um, see that on either the down imaging or the 2D. Right. Now, the side imaging shot is a little skewed because mm -hmm. you can tell that he was uh, moving, turning his boat when he when they were filming that one. I was kind of proud that I found that one. I'm not yeah, sure. that's actually that was a good that was a good uh, a good shot. But that's the key. Um, if it's on a rock pile, I got to look at it because that's something on top of something that's nice. Um, so, so that's kind of what I'm looking for. Um, an isolated brush pile is a good brush pile. The more that brush that's around, um, the more they have an opportunity to spread out. That is a massive. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one 
listen, this is a serious question. How the hell are you going to attack that? Because me, I don't want any part of that. I'm going to, I'm going to dink and dunk around the edges of that with a drop shot and a shaky head because I, I, I I'm not going to be able to pull anything out of the middle of that thing. No, you're not, but that's not going to be one until it starts to decay where the middle is going to become a player. So they're going to use this around it within 50 well, they'll, feet around they, this they, thing. They'll get in it. That you they'll, can access. Yeah, they'll get in the thing. The only way you can access that is to punch deep, put a heavy weight on and punch that thing. But the you reality the reality of it is, okay, um, I, I wait till the leaves start to get algae and the animals and stuff start to eat all the leaves off of that thing. Um, fresh brush piles bug me, even though I know there are times when they love the leaves. Mm -hmm. fresh br fresh brush bugs me um the the best and there and it wouldn't even be a true brush pile but willows are the best when the leaves grow on the willows but that's a that's a live tree um leaves on brush piles i have very limited success on brush piles with leaves on them um and probably the worst ones are pine trees when the needles are still on them Okay. Uh, this is an example. This is also, you know, you see the habitat barge. So this is some professional, you know, state brush that they're sinking, but this is the, what you were talking about, what just showed that last one was the bush style, the thick, the gnarly stuff. This is more of a limb style. Correct. Correct. And that, and th those are real easy to fish. Um, mm -hmm. Limb style like that are really easy to fish. Most of the time, whether you're side imaging it or down imaging or 2D in it, you can see the bass in that tree. Um, and you'll know that you need to be dinking around it. But that's really, I mean, it's not, the, the hardest part about brush pile fishing, in my opinion, is finding them and finding the good ones, um, which, is, which is why I wanted to show you on a, topographical map kind of where where we're looking at boat docks are obvious but out in front and in between not so obvious um you know uh, i i grew up fishing on lake norman where you're fishing boat docks most of the time and almost every dock has brush on them and they're not all created equal um you know, the tricks with boat docks could be depth, um, bottom composition, taper of the bottom. Do they want it gradual? Do they want it flat? Um, is it near a break line? Is the end of the dock over deep water? Is it a floating dock? I find a lot of brush piles on some of the spotted bass fisheries down south underneath floating docks. And those, those br brush piles under floating docks are sick spotted bass holders. Mm -hmm. um, because they have the safety of the dock overhead and the brush pile beneath. They also suspend underneath the floating sponsoons. They literally get right up against them almost. Um, and so they have the cover of the brush, the safety of the floating dock, um, you know, just things to look at. And you can pattern, you can pattern fish in brush piles, just like you can on grass edges et cetera, et cetera. You know, do they want bushy brush piles or do they want sporadic, thicker hardwood brush piles? Um, water depth. Uh, are they, are you catching them on brush that's on a break, brush that's on an inside edge of a point? Um, you can pattern this. So you got to pay attention to all of that. Um, your lure choices, pretty standard, mm -hmm. pretty standard. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll just throw some doc stuff out that most people don't want to talk about, but I will. Let's say you don't have side imaging. You just have 2D. How do you identify whether a brush is under a dock or not? Okay. It, it, because, I, I mean, there's some tricks of the trade by looking yeah. above the water that determine oh, what's yeah. under the water. I don't know if you want to get into that. You want to keep that in your back pocket. That's up to you, Uncle Frank. I kind of... Well, you brought it up, so we we don't hold back on this show. Um, the easiest way to tell if there's a brush pile on a boat dock is look and see if it's got lights. 
if it's got lights angled into the water, it's a crappie dude. And he's got a brush pile out there and his floodlight is angled towards the brush pile. Um, and that particular brush pile will be away from the boat dock. Um, and so that's a really big key. A lot of times you can see the brush sticking up under some of the boat docks, mm -hmm. or you'll see rope hanging down from the middle of underneath the boat dock. And the rope hanging down, it's got brush tied to it. Um, another neat little trick that, because you're in crappie country, so you've mm -hmm. seen this, there'll be a trap door on a boat dock where they could lift up the trap door and fish right out. Right, Like underneath. basically ice fishing, but through a dock. Correct. Um, if I see a trap door on a dock, that dock's loaded with brush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That dock is loaded with brush. I'm, I'm also looking... Uh, this is when you, you just mentioned that the crappie I'm looking for seats on a dock, folding Dude. chairs, sit down seats, oh, yeah. anything that's not, you know, we're not talking like a love bench where you're making out with your honey in the end of right. the dock. We're talking, <laughs> we're talking like about a about chair a tool. that, a, that <laughs> an old a... man sits in and drops <laughs> a minnow on a jig down. Right. Uh, and rod holders on the side of the dock. And based on where those seats are, tells you where the brush is. Exactly, because they're not going to be pointing away from the brush pile. Mm -hmm. um, you know, rod holders on the dock rails is another dead giveaway. Um, minnow buckets tied on rope hanging yep. over the side uh, of the dock is another A lot way. of times you can also look up on the banks and see if guys are starting to do brush piles. If they have cinder blocks or something on yeah. their dock, that tells me that they are – they're getting ready getting ready to drop some brush and that there's a lot of brush around i'm looking for uh an active dock that only has fishing boats in it I an also, aluminum fishing right. boat is way better than a guy with a pair of jet skis correct i will say i will not say the lake i was on because i'm 100 percent sure this is totally 1000 percent illegal but <laughs> i i noticed that the, I saw cut trees on the bank mm -hmm. and I started idling around where the cut trees were working my way out from the bank. And I started finding brush piles and I noticed this in a couple of pockets cause it was earlier in the year. So I noticed there was in a couple pockets, I would see parts of branches sawed off, sometimes small trees sawed off. And I thought first, the first time I saw that and I did that, I thought it was just, I just got lucky. Well, then I went into another pocket really close to that one and noticed it again. And I started finding all these brush piles. And what I realized was, because I saw this one dude dragging them around, he was removing them. He was relocating his brush piles. Mm -hmm. So I asked him. I said, dude, what are you doing, man? He goes, he goes, these crappie guys up here, he goes, we're so competitive that they'll find your brush pile. So I relocate mine every week. There you go. And in the spring, <laughs> so what he, they do is they relocate them. They literally hook them up with an anchor and mm -hmm. drag them somewhere else. Grappling hook. Right. That's exactly what it is. It's like a little, you know, try like a, like a treble hook with no yep. barbs on it. And they just relocate them. They drag them somewhere else in the pocket and let them go, put them in their GPS and let them go. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of, it's crazy. Uh, the crappie use the fresh brush. I noticed these guys that were burying brush. I asked the one guy, how fast will the crappies come on there? He goes, well, it's spring. So they're coming here. He goes, this brush will have crappies on it tomorrow. Wow. And I was, I was uh, very surprised by it, that. It's interesting. Another thing that I want to point out that you mentioned in the first half of the show is there will be a pattern to the brush. It won't just be totally random. Now, each person might do yeah. it differently on the dock, but if you're looking in between docks and let's say you find a brush pile right here, there's a very good chance that there'll be another one here, another one here, another Correct. one here, and another one here because a guy doesn't want to go through all the trouble of dropping one brush pile and then having to run 15 miles to fish the Correct. rest of them. 
when he knows that he can hit five brush piles down a productive bank. So when you find one, it's kind of like a Where's Waldo deal where right there's going to be more. Right. And and if you look at the three or four things that that one you found has in common, then you can deductive reasoning can tell you where the others are likely to be. Correct. It could be where the channel swings closer, where there's a point, a flat. It could be something different. Um, and that's the that's the whole key. Because 90 percent of the time, the guys who are dropping brush know what the hell's going on. Now, oh, I'm yeah. not going to lie. I've told you I've told you this off air. I found someone who was sinking Christmas trees on a lake in Oklahoma. I was like, that's a weird place for a Christmas tree. I found one on the dam. It was, mm -hmm. I'm like, that's weird. Well, it was also a fake Christmas tree and the lights were still on it. So <laughs> not everybody, <laughs> not, not everybody who's sick at brush does exactly what the hell they're doing. That's just a guy who's heard, Hey, sink your Christmas tree. And he, yeah. to do, do and he that. just said, there's a good place. I could reach it from the road. And it happened to be and, a fake oh. one with the lights. Or he got sick and tired of putting Christmas toys together yeah. and, and went on a rage and threw the tree in the lake. This is information packed, Uncle Frank. I don't think you, I, I don't think you understand how much you've given up in this in this installment of day four. Yeah, brush piles are unique. Um, they're fun to fish. They're highly productive, and they're so easy to locate. They are what, so easy to locate. What else we got here before we wrap up day four, number one hundred and twenty-one? I can't, dude. I can't believe we got one hundred and twenty-one in the books already. Doesn't that like? Isn't well, that's not amazing to you because you've been doing it for 16 years or 17 years. So, I guess it's a lot, but it's a lot, it's a shocking amount. You're right. If we're doing one a week, yeah, it's two years. That makes it. You think we'll make it to 500? Yeah, we're gonna make it to 500. We are making it. I think by but the I time th we get to 500 shows, we're gonna have. Well, we're going to have a day four book out. We're going to have, <laughs> we'll uh, have. <laughs> multiple uh, day four uh, on location seminar slash vacation retreat getaways. We might have a day four cruise by then. <laughs> I he don't doesn't do, want to drink a pina colada and be stuck on a giant boat with Frank for four I days. Do, I don't do cruise ships. You don't? I will absolutely no way in hell go on a cruise ship. This is a lifelong thing. This isn't just a recent thing. No, this is a lifelong thing. A, I can't. Uh, you have be, a phobia. I can't be captive on something that I'm not in control of for that length of time, and I am not going to be stuck out on the ocean in a cruise ship. There ain't no. There is no possible. You will never see Uncle Frank on a cruise ship. You but, know that's a medical condition. Yeah, I have a lot of phobias. I'm not lying. Navophobia. <laughs> the fear of large bodies of water and is the fear of boats and cruise ships. Well, I'm not afraid the fear of, of boats. being on a boat or cruise ship. I am not afraid of boats, obviously. I just can't be on something for a week that I have no control yeah. over. You have navophobia, Uncle Frank. I have a I have a small portion of it. I will not be caught on a cruise ship. There is no way in hell. Um, it's not happening. But You have navophobia. But I could be on a tiki hut on the beach sharing a, a pina colada with... Listen, here's fans. what I have in mind. We made the day four shirts happen. We made the meet and greet at the classic happen. We made the giveaways of the drawings happen. We need to have an... an in-person on location seminar slash drink some cold pops with uncle frank a, a three or four day getaway educational entertaining engaging at a at, at one of these deals where you don't have to have your boat you can come on you can get on the boat with uncle frank you can hear some stories you can tell some stories you can share some meats and cheeses and cold beverages and it's like a four day weekend <laughs> that's what i have in my head Okay, well, we 10, we, to, 10 to 20 people. You bring your buddy along. 
we toss it around. We're, we're tossing it around. Isn't if we're going to get to 500 episodes, somewhere between 121 and 500, this needs to happen. 125. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not going to be like next week, Frank will be down with a grill by the river edge. This is like a <laughs> six months in exchange, like six months to a year out. Like we're planning this out. Yeah. We'll, like we'll a vacation. We'll, we'll figure something out. Are you opposed to that? I'm not opposed to anything except spending a week on a cruise ship. <laughs> That's all I'm opposed to. <laughs> okay. So the day four cruise is out. I'll cancel. There were some pieces in motion. I'll cancel that. And we'll work more towards dry land with optional boating opportunities. That's better. That's better. I, I'm I'm uh, I'm very comfortable as the captain of my own ship. Um, let's just put it that way. My my wife tried to get me cruise going a cruise. I'm like, you better find someone else. I'm not going. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this has been. Day four, number 121 with the man, Frank Scalish, all about brush piles. And cruise we'll ships. <laughs> <laughs> and navophobia. <laughs> it's a real thing, folks. We'll all talk right. to everybody next week. <laughs> See ya. See ya.